Sure. Okay, great. All right, thank you, Young, and thank you, Greenwich Library, for um, offering the investing discussion group. You, you, you guys do a great job with all of your programming. Uh, this is the second season of the investing discussion group, and we are really excited to focus on the best selling books that will help you reach your financial goals faster. We kicked off the year. So our year is more like a school year because we take the summer off. So uh, the kickoff to our year was in September. And we started with the psychology of money, uh, which I thought was a great discussion. And if you missed it, you can go to the library's YouTube page. I'm I'm convinced you would just go to the, the YouTube homepage and just you know search Greenwich Library. I think it would pop right up. And then they have a video section. And so The Psychology of Money, if you're interested in it, it's a great book, huge bestseller, sold 2 million copies, which is really unheard of for a nonfiction financial title. Um, so we, we did that. We really delved into the book and what Morgan Housel was saying. And um, the whole, you know, the whole idea is just to really look at the books that can help you. So we're excited. Once a month, we're picking a different book. And today we're doing The Bond King by Mary Childs, How One Man Made a Market, Built an Empire and Lost It All. And then planning ahead, if you want to actually read these books so you can participate in discussion or ask some questions. Um, in November, we're doing a Random Walk Down Wall Street, which is kind of a famous title. Uh, Burton Malkiel is, uh, he was for years a professor at Princeton, and now he is, I think, a professor emeritus. Uh, but, and his is definitely a best-selling book as well. And then in December, we are going to do um, How to Invest in Real Estate. And the real estate topic last year was like a huge success. So I think people were kind of clamoring for more about real estate. And when we look at real estate, we go way, way, way beyond just not just like owning your home, fixing it up, or even just like a flip. Like we, we, we go all out when we talk about real estate. So that'll be something to look forward to. And if you haven't yet, you definitely want to sign up for those so you can get the email reminders that the webinar is coming. Okay, but tonight we are doing The Bond King. And how can The Bond King help you reach your financial goals faster? Because we really want to pick books that are relevant to you. And, uh, you know, bonds might sound boring. Uh, to me, they're anything but, because I love investing. Uh, but bonds are also essential to investing. And we're going to really do a review of that and help you understand the market and asset allocation and things like that uh, in a lively and jargon-free manner, because that's what we do around here. Um, you also, you know, can benefit from this book because if you're going to invest, you need to learn to manage risk. And I think uh, Bill Gross, who was the Bond King, did a fantastic job of that in this book, and he really makes it come alive. Um, and we also have to learn to manage ourselves. And part of this book is sort of, you know, one man's trials and tribulations, and you know, when things uh, in his work get um, competitive and there's palace intrigue and things like that. Uh, how does he handle it when he's um, under criticism, uh, when people's interests are not aligned with his? You know, we all deal with those things. And how do we stay the course? How do we stay calm? How do we stay strategic? So I thought it was an interesting book in that sense. And also, how do we manage our families at those times, which, uh, you know, by the outcome that Bill Gross had with his divorce, maybe <laughs> that didn't work out too well. Um, and also, it's just a great read. So uh, I think you're really going to enjoy The Bond King. Uh, but before we start, I, I do need this disclaimer. Um, Young, Young, could you yes. could you mute could you mute for right now? Because oh, um, okay, I see I muted uh, most people. Two new people just signed up. Oh, great! Thanks. Um, so this webinar is for educational purposes only. It is not intended to provide investment advice. None of the bonds or bond funds or bond ETFs mentioned in this discussion group are specifically discouraged or recommended. If you plan to buy or sell bonds or investments of any kind, you are urged to consult an advisor who is aware of your unique needs and situation. Okay, so our author, Mary Childs, who is Mary Childs? Mary Childs has an incredibly impressive resume. She studied business journalism at Washington and Lee, and then she has worked for some of the premier 
um, media outlets like Bloomberg, Financial Times, Barron's. She's worked for years. She's written for years. Um, and currently she's a co-host. Uh, I, I don't know if you listen to Planet Money, it's absolutely delightful. It's such an intelligent way, such a, a lively and fun way to learn about economics and money and investing and all sorts of interesting topics. Um, so she's a co-host at Planet Money. And um, I would say that she's also a thorough researcher. This book was extremely well-researched. I listened to a few uh, interviews she was on. And at one point she said she talked to 240 people in order to prepare for this book, very thorough. Uh, she wrote, uh, read thousands of documents like court documents and articles and you know all sorts of, um, I guess Bill Gross himself did a lot of writing. He was kind of famous for his investment outlook. And so she read all of those and uh, she's just really an excellent, highly professional, person. So um, I was really glad to recommend her and recommend this book. Um, and then, you know, she did go to Washington and Lee, which uh, it's so funny. Once you, uh, when I was looking at schools for my daughter, who's now at Vanderbilt, we looked at Washington and Lee and I fell in love with that place. And now it's just like anything. Once you, once you notice something, you start to see it everywhere. And now I'm finding all of these really smart, successful people who went to Washington and Lee. So that is a free plug for Washington and Lee. So I hope those Washington and Lee people send me a sweatshirt or something, you know, mug. Okay, who is the Bond King? Bill Gross is the Bond King. And back in the 70s, or actually, actually in the 60s, he went to Duke and um, he had to serve in Vietnam. So he did that. And then the very early 70s, he went to UCLA Business School uh, and then he got a job out of business school at a sleepy insurance company, but he, he had a great idea. He and some buddies had a great idea and he was in the right place at the right time. And he had sympathetic bosses. Uh, I don't want to give the whole story away, but he co-founded PIMCO and, um, and, and PIMCO has become one of the largest bond managers in the world. And he's also a certain kind of genius, I would say, having read this book that he has uh, what I would call, you know, in this world of ADD and ADHD, he's literally the opposite. Some of the things he does, you know, it's like he could sit still for hours and, you know, barely move and just study the markets and study the opportunities. And just that power of pure focus really comes, comes across. And also, uh, not to give it away, because we'll talk about it more later, but he had a real specialty for sniffing out risk. Um, which you would, might think bonds are boring and what's the point, but you'll, you'll come to find out how really important it is to be able to judge risk in the bond world. And he also, and this, he admits this himself, he had a desire for fame. So he wanted to use his business success to become famous. Okay, so bonds are essential to investing. Um, so let's just look at bonds. A little bit, okay. And and when we get closer to the book part, we're going to have more of a discussion. But at any time, if something pops into your head, you want me to slow down, you have a question about anything, go ahead and put it in the chat. And then um, when we get closer, or you know, if you're an expert and you know something about bonds that I'm talking about, just unmute and participate, and that would be great. Um, but if I'm in the middle of something and you want to, you know, get your point across, definitely put it in the chat. I see that we have one thing in the chat right now, so I'm just going to check it out. Maybe it's something Young did. Oh, okay. Yeah. Feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question or um, if you want to make a comment, anything like that. Okay, great. All right. So let's look into this bond universe, shall we? A lot of people don't know this, that the market for bonds is actually larger than the market for stocks. And that it makes sense if you start to think about it, that, you know, bonds are a loan. And a, you know, a school like Babson has bonds, but it can't, Babson can't take itself self public. Uh, it's a private institution. Um, so you, we all understand when businesses need loans. So we understand like Starbucks, you know, having bonds and public storage having bonds. I tried to pick some two companies I knew actually had bonds. I mean, the bond world is not that transparent and I don't really have access other than the Wall Street Journal to a lot of news about bonds, but I tried to pick some real world examples. I know these two companies actually do issue bonds. Um, but beyond that, you know, you have governments like our government issuing 
bonds and you know treasuries or what what have you. Uh, and obviously the government cannot be publicly traded. Towns cannot be publicly traded. School districts cannot be, you know, things like that. So there, this it, it makes sense once you start to think about it, why is the bond world so large? Well, a lot of entities would like to borrow some money, you know, makes sense. You know, refurbish a school, build a new bridge, help Babson College have a better library, you know, <laughs> whatever they're going to do. Um, and it's really this vast universe uh, where entities, private entities, nonprofits, whatever, are asking for money and um, whether or not they get it, at what price they get it, for how long they get it. That's the, that's the whole beauty of the bond world. And it is truly larger than the stock market, uh, currently valued at $52.9 trillion dollars. And the stock market is measly, you know, 40.5 trillion. So what is there to learn about a loan? Doesn't this sound boring? What could, it's just so straightforward, right? It's just lend the money at a certain rate for a certain duration, end of story, what's there to talk about? Well, considering how badly bonds did in 2022, and I mean, words like bloodbath, were used. This is just a selection of headlines from Forbes and the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg. Um, 2022 was a disaster. Well, really, if, if we're just talking about loans, how can loans be a disaster, right? Unless there's a, most people think, well, how could there be a disaster unless there was a default, unless whoever borrowed the money refused to pay it back or couldn't pay back all of it or something like that. And it doesn't work that way. So since bonds are going to be an important part of your future, uh, especially because you're supposed to hold a greater proportion of bonds as you age, you really kind of want to understand how bonds work and why would there be any risk? You know, how could there be a bloodbath in something so straightforward? So we're going to talk about that. So here's the thing. There's a lot to learn with bonds. And this is why the 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 Bond King ends up being a really interesting book because it's reinforcing all of these things and watching Bill Gross and his team be so smart and kind of beat, and, and they're up against other really smart people. So that's, that's what's so interesting is like, you know, somebody's winning at this game. Well, what is, you know, what are the tactics? What are the strategies? What is there to even know that you have to win? Um, and there are a lot of risks, right? So there's interest rate risk, um, which is, linked with duration risk, and we'll get into that. There's default risk. There's what I call fund risk, because it, most of the time you're not just gonna buy an individual bond, you're gonna go into a bond fund, so your money's being pooled with other people, and you're in a lot of trouble if all those people panic at once, because now there's a fire sale on the underlying assets, and you get hurt even though you didn't panic. So there's a lot of risk going on. And then even in good times, there's call risk. So when everything's going smoothly and your bonds are performing well, then the people who own the bonds might call the bonds because they want to like, you know, return you your money and then and be able to issue, you know, bonds at a lower rate. Um, and then there are always fees to worry about. So there are all these things that you're going to have to navigate if you want to be a good and successful bond investor. And it's also why the book is so interesting because Bill Gross is a genius at bond strategy. And somehow Mary Childs, who's a great storyteller, really makes it worth listening to. It's like, you know, you wouldn't think that duration risk would be something you'd want to focus on, but um, she makes it really cool. So let's just try to give a real world example, something simple. Uh, I know Starbucks issues bonds. I don't actually particularly know if you could buy them directly for this particular amount, but let's just say you could. So this is how people were making money trading bonds, because we have to keep in mind that the whole innovation, the whole reason this book existed is that Bill Gross, he did not invent bond trading, but you know it was kind of percolating up. It was just an idea in the 70s. And he heard about it and he and his, his buddies went to their boss and they said, we've got to do this. Like, this is going to be a thing. We want to be in there first. And so, Bond trading used to really not exist, and you know, before the 70s, there's, you know, companies purchased a bond. It was a physical, like, paper thing that they put in their vault, 
It had literally coupons attached and you'd take scissors and detach the coupon and mail in the coupon for your interest payment. I mean, this was the 1970s, really. It was hard for us to remember, like the rotary phones, no computers, no cell phones. Um, I mean, it was really like, you know, not the dinosaurs, but close. Um, but anyway, if we just think of a regular bond, right? So a bond, you know, someone issues a bond like Starbucks. And if I were to participate, it's like maybe I give them $10,000. I'm going to give it to them. I'm willing to hold the bond to duration for 10 years. And I know I'm going to get 5%. And I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that arrangement. You know, 5% every year, 5% of my 10,000 every year. It's kind of a sleepy transaction, right? Well, then somebody like a Bill Gross comes along and now bonds are being traded. And this is really interesting because as bonds are being traded, interest rates are moving up and down, right? So interest rates, like what's, what someone actually has to offer, right? When they wanna borrow money, what they have to offer is you know, gonna really be dependent on like, well, what is the government you know, getting for like when the government wants to borrow money, that's considered a risk-free loan really. So what, what is the, if the government has to pay 3%, 4%, 5%, and that's risk-free, then any corporation is going to have to go higher than that, right? So in this example, we're just saying, you know, there was a time Starbucks issues a loan, they're offering 5%, right? Well, then interest rates start to fall. And the next issuance of Starbucks bonds, much lower, right? 3%, right? So this is how people made money in bonds, trading bonds, because the person who's getting 5% a year on 10,000 is holding something that's much more valuable than the person who's getting 3%, right? So you can imagine there'd be this secondary market where if I wanted to sell, I didn't want to hold to maturity, I wanted to sell, I would actually get a premium. Buyers would pay me a premium for the bond that I'm sitting on because they can't get a good deal in the current issues of bonds, if that makes sense. So now let's look at what Bill Gross, like the world Bill Gross inherited when he decided to start his bond shop. So at the time, you know, conditions seemed very unfavorable, right? I mean, nobody knew that interest rates were going to fall, 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 fall for 40 years. As interest rates fall, you make money in bonds, right? So uh, just in the environment, Bill Gross and his folks are seeming like geniuses because they're in the right place at the right time. Now, he's certainly proven himself to be like much more than just someone who took advantage of timing because, you know, his peer group, you know, started to evolve and other people started to get in the game. And then it's like, then you have to beat those people and, and they're, you know, Morningstar is keeping track of all of this and stuff. But it's really important to think about how from 1982 to 2021, you had 40 year trend of declining interest rates, which also made bonds, you know, to the average person seem like, oh, bonds are good. Bonds are safe. People make money in bonds. You kept hearing about people making money in bonds. So prior to 2022, investors spent a lifetime enjoying declining or sideways, sideways interest rates. And when interest rates decline, bond prices go up, the people who are holding the bonds are making money, not just the money on their interest, but they are making money on the fact that they can trade their bond and their bond is more valuable than the newer bonds. And this is really, really important. You know, this is being recorded. If you don't remember what I'm saying, you can log on again and play it back again and be like, well, I don't get it, but you have to get this. You have to get how interest rates impact bonds. Okay, because then everything changed, right? Here's your bloodbath. <laughs> Here's your lousy year. Here's where all those screaming headlines came from. Um, now, what's interesting is, you know, being in this arena and really paying attention to interest rates, when interest rates got absurdly low and you started having long duration bonds at a very, very low interest rate, I'm just scratching my head thinking, who is buying that? Who would lock themselves into like a 2%? I kid you not. I wish I, I, wish I had like the transcript to this podcast. There's this this really smart guy, Chris Nelson, he does a podcast called The Bond 
investment mentor. I, he, he basically teaches, he teaches community banks how to invest their money in bonds. And he always does kind of an update to the market. And I was listening to one of his shows and it talked about how like the 30 year bond was at 2%. And I just gasped because I thought, who on earth would lock themselves in to a 2% yield for 30 years? But I guess that's what you do. Well, I would never do it, but I guess somebody did it. Uh, people did it. Because now you can imagine how really worthless that bond is as interest rates rise. I mean, you've locked yourself into only making 2% on your money for 30 years. And all these bonds are coming out now where the yield is twice that. And you're talking about 30 years. I mean, they, it's so like it's so troubling to me that people don't really understand how bonds work. So I think they don't really understand how they could get themselves in a heap of trouble. They really, there's this sense that bonds are boring and safe. And yet you can lose a lot of money in bonds. And that's what people are finding out. So now we have this opposite of ri a rising interest rate environment. So you're hearing about people lose money in bonds. And what's, what kills me is, I mean, it's sad that people are losing money, but now a lot of people, as they hear all of this, they go, oh, people are losing money. It's bad. It's a bloodbath. I need to stay away. Again, because they don't really understand how bonds work. If you're new to the game, if you're the new entrant, you have an opportunity. It's the person who's stuck with all those low yielding bonds that's getting killed. So, I, you know, you really, it's kind of the opposite of chasing returns. I mean, people have the bad habit of chasing returns, but they, they also have the bad habit of avoiding when they hear bad news. When I think it was, who was it, Rothschild? There was some famous quote of like, you know, the time to buy is when there bl there's blood in the streets. I mean, those are the opportunities. So, you know, other people got killed in bonds because they're holding on to low yielding, long duration bonds. But everyone listening tonight, if you haven't been in yet, you actually have an opportunity. Okay, so, and he like, here's, so here's how this opportunity, or here's how it, how people, you know, are losing, you know, losing money in bonds, but that's because they're already in, right? So they had this fictitious Starbucks bond, uh, you know, $10,000 at 3% for 10 years. But now, you know, if Starbucks wanted to in issue bonds today, I think they'd have to do even more than 5%, frankly, but, you know, they'd have to go up. And so then the, the earlier bonds become less valuable. Um, and how this all gets discounted is, kind of, you know, there's a whole science behind it, because I'm not sure that we even assume that that rates are going to stay high, right? So it's it's really a dynamic market of, we know that there are bonds being issued today with a higher yield that are more valuable, um, and that the 3% the bond is now less valuable. But then if rates come down again, I mean, the whole thing, it's, it's just constantly moving. It's, it's kind of a guessing game, and that's what makes it really interesting. Okay. And then also, if, if you really know how the system works, and also if you have enough money, uh, you can just avoid all of this trading and just get yourself bonds where you just purposely hold them to maturity and you don't really have to worry about, you know, sort of the secondary market and whether or not the bond is losing money. And I just kind of grabbed this quote from Forbes magazine so to, to relay that, that like, you know, there is such a thing as just like, you're happy with the money you're making, you hold it to maturity, you don't care how it could be traded. So, and also you're not part of a bond fund, so you're not losing money because other people are panicking and things like that. Okay, so you've got interest rate risk, you gotta understand how interest rates work, then you've got default risk. And it's amazing to me that, you know, just like you, you know, you have a credit score, right? So TransUnion and Equifax and Experian, they're watching your behavior, they're tracking your, you know, whether or not you're paying your car loan, your credit cards, your, you know, your store cards, all of those things. And they're giving you a score and they're giving, you know, and, and just like you, these loans have a score. So, you know, when Starbucks borrows money, before they went to borrow money, they were rated by the rating agencies. And before towns borrow money, they're rated by rating agencies. And the government is rated by rating agencies and uh, kind of got knocked by, by rating agencies recently. So, you know, I'm, I'm only showing Moody's scoring, but there are the big three, there's Standard and Poor's and Fitch and Moody's, and they're giving out these ratings. And, um, you know, that you want that AAA rating, that's, you know, totally like judged to be the highest quality, right? 
Um, and then it goes down from there. And then once you get to BA, you're starting to get into speculative elements and maybe substantial risk and things like that. And what's crazy is it keeps going. I mean, it goes down and down and down and down. And um, these ratings get really, really down low, definitely below investment grade. And that's what that's where you get to junk bonds. But you know, most people when they're trying to sell them to you don't call them junk bonds, they call them high yield bonds. And I saw the most amazing thing in, um, so I had this friend who got her 401k brochure and she was kind enough to give me a copy. And in this 401k brochure, there was a high yield bond fund that was listed as a conservative investment. And I thought that's just so crazy because of course it's not a conservative investment. I'm not saying don't do it. You know, a lot of people are chasing yield um, and, you know, a lot of junk bonds are fine, you know, they, they work out. So it, it's just very complicated. And so I'm, I'm not saying stay away. That's I have, not, it's not my business, but um, you have to know what you're getting yourself into. And if you're in high yield bonds, you're in bonds that the rating agencies have decided are not that credit worthy. Uh, I don't know, sort of like dating someone who has like a credit score under 600. Oh, would you do it? I, uh, I wouldn't do it. Um, okay. There's also fund risk. Right? So a lot of people don't have the wherewithal to buy individual bonds and just hold them to maturity. So they're pooling their money in mutual funds. And in theory, this should be a great idea. Everybody pools their money and then the fund manager goes out and buys some high quality bonds and that's fine. But then when you have a year like 2022 and people are panicking and they're pulling their money out, all of a sudden the asset manager in order to repay, in order to give people their money back, he has to have a fire sale. He has to sell the bonds he's holding, you know, at a huge discount, which is, you know, that's never good. The panic selling is never good. And now the people who didn't panic are linked to the people who did. Um, so that's, you know, sort of fund risk. And don't even get me started about ETF risk. There is, it used to be very complicated to access the bond market. Um, it's nothing like stocks. It's not like you just open your phone and go on your brokerage and you just start buying shares. Um, but now ETFs are making it seem, exchange traded funds are making it seem like it is that easy. And there is a whole liquidity risk around this because if you're buying, you know, top of the line bond, you know, bond funds that, you know, access things that are highly liquid, then, then okay, but you know, I, you're gonna mark my words. You're gonna start seeing some really out of whack things about people buying ETFs in bonds that are not that liquid. And then if there's a shock to the market, and something weird is gonna happen because the underlying asset is 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 very hard to price. So um, it is getting really really complicated. But I am not a fan of bond ETFs. Um, and then even in good times, right? You've got some problems. You have call risk. So. You've worked out all the other things. The interest rates are going your way. The, the, you're you're only in high quality, you know, AAA rated things. And then all of a sudden, there's call risk. And call risk happens when you know you're you're borrowing or you're lending to good corporations. You know, you're lending to the Starbucks and things like that. And they, you know, you, you were happy to lend to them. They were giving you six percent or seven percent or whatever the interest rate. Well, then they realized if if we're if the interest rates were to reverse and come down again, they realize that they could kind of refinance the way you refinance a house and lock in a lower rate. And so they say, oh, hey, you know, thanks for giving us our loan, you know, the loan, but we're going to pay you back early. And that's what call, and they're going to call the bond. They're going to pay you back early, which you don't want to be paid back early because you were happy to lock in a nice interest rate. So even in good times, you have a call risk. And, and then all the time you have the risk of fees. And you know Vanguard is kind of famous for having super ultra low fees. And there are a bunch of other places out there, super ultra low fees. Um, but then you know there are a ton of funds out there where imagine you're only gonna make 5% and their fee really adds up to like you know, 0.9%, it's almost 1%. I mean, they're basically taking 20% of your gains every year. So, um, and I think they, they partly do it because most people don't understand the math. They go like, oh, okay, well, I don't care if you take 1% of my investment gains. Well, you should care if you're only making 5%. Oh, okay, so this, I'm sorry, I, I kind of left out this call risk idea. Um, so David Swenson, who was who ran the Yale Endowment for years, the, the call risk really bugged him. So he had a nice quote about it, like it's sort of, you know, was it tails I, 
heads I win, tails you lose kind of thing. So you, you finally line up your bond and then everything's going swimmingly. And then of course, then it gets called because you know that was too good to be true. Um, okay, and the fees. Okay, so we've already done the fees. And why, why don't we talk about the book? Um, but please, if you have any questions about what I just covered with bonds, I mean, that that's just the backdrop of um, the Bond King, Bill Gross, it's the 70s. Really, all this risk hasn't happened yet because these bonds aren't being traded and they're not being pooled in that way. But this is kind of what's to come. And our story begins in the 70s. And Bill Gross has graduated from business school and he's gotten a job at Pacific Mutual, which is just a sleepy uh, insurance company in California. And somehow he gets the idea. I think a guy, Howard Rakoff, kind of comes to him, has lunch with him and says, you know, what you really need to do is you need, you need to partner with me and with a bunch of others. We need to be trading these bonds. They shouldn't just be sitting in a vault. You know, your life insurance company is sitting on all these bonds. Other companies, other asset managers are sitting on bonds. And, you know, can't you imagine that you would want to trade them? There, there are going to be reasons that you're going to want to trade them. And Bill Gross loves that idea. And he's got two partners and they love that idea and they convince their boss. And for whatever reason, the boss actually gives these three young guys money to play with. And they're allowed to start their own company and they're allowed to get like a stake in the company, which is really kind of incredible. And they just start trading bonds. They just start reaching out and making a market, like being the people who make a market in bonds. And this was, wild innovation, you know, really hadn't happened. So I think we kind of figured out that their timing was impeccable, right? I mean, if if you make money in bonds when interest rates are slowly decreasing and they, they stepped in, I mean, you know, it probably didn't see, seem that way at the time because it, it, the, the real descent didn't start till 1982 and these guys were more in the late 70s. But just introducing the idea, just creating the mechanism, creating the market to trade the bonds. There are so many inefficiencies, so many arbitrage opportunities. And then they got the wind at their back. So they were smart enough to set it up, smart, smart enough to start getting clients, start, smart enough to start making this market of trading these bonds. And then they had the wind at their back with the interest rates going lower. And when that happens, it's like you're just automatically making money. What you're sitting on is more va valuable to the new investor. And so the clients that you have are pleased. They see that they're making money, right? They, that you, you're, what these guys are sitting on, they're now selling to the new people and they're making money for their clients. So money is coming in um, and they're also making really smart trades. And so it's, kind of complicated. I don't know, did any would anybody want to like explain some of the trades? Because I, 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 I use the term arbitrage. I mean, some of this is just like, you just, these guys just were so smart and so thorough and they kind of noticed that there were inefficiencies in this market, especially with like convertible bonds. So if you had a bond that could be converted to stock and they're, they're like, well, there's something, there's sort of an imbalance here. There's something that I could really take advantage of here. So um, I'm, I was geeking out. I, this is probably like way too geeky for the regular person, but um, it was kind of cool how they were, they were finding opportunities and amassing clients and doing all these smart trades and doing, and, they, and you know, just being thoroughly dedicated and things like that. Um, and then Bill Gross himself, he really comes off as sort of the risk king and his background. So, you know, again, the whole ADHD, ADD world, I mean, I don't know if it's the social media or the television or the whatever, but, you know, here's a guy who grew up where, you know, you went out and played, <laughs> went out, you, know, you, you went through the forest. Um, he, he just was such thoughtful, deep guy. And then um, he actually had a very serious car accident in college. So he was at Duke University. He was in his fraternity. They sent him out for donuts. I'm not kidding. This is literally true. It's in the book. They send him out for donuts. He gets in a terrible, terrible car accident and he's in the hospital for months. 
and he's bored and he's he's so incredibly bored and somehow he gets his hand on ed thorpe so ed thorpe is a guy who comes up over and over again in investing and he's really featured in this book called the quant so a lot of these quantitative guys kind of got their inspiration from him and he's basically wrote a book about um beat the I, I guess his first one was beat the dealer where he was really talking about card counting and putting the odds in your favor and a lot of people sort of understand that you can put the odds in your favor, but who really has the discipline to do it? I mean, you who really has the focus to notice all the cards that the dealer is dealing and keeping track, you know, because you can't get away with making notes at like a blackjack table, <laughs> but keeping track of all these different things happening and in your head, just in your head and starting to see that you know, where you could get an edge and, and where you have something over, you know, the dealer with getting to 21 without um, going over 21. So Bill Gross, he, has, he had nothing else to do in this hospital, studied this book. And then he literally took himself to Las Vegas and he stayed in a $6 a night hotel. And he just got himself to the blackjack table. And he claims that you know, part of the strategy is that you have to put time on your side, meaning like you know, anything can, even if the odds are in your favor, you can have a stretch of two or three hours where you know, the odds don't fall into play. You know, it, it's like the repetition that puts the, puts the odds in your favor. So he would go for 12 hour stretches of playing blackjack, which I didn't even know you could do. I actually had no idea that <laughs> I've never been to a casino at like seven in the morning. So I didn't know people were there at seven, eight, nine in the morning. That's kind of scary to me. But he learned to count these cards and he, he was making really small bets. He was making like $1 bets, but he had a system and he was dedicated and he was thorough. And he ended up making like $10,000 in a few months. Um, which is a lot of money in the 1970s. And it just really speaks to his sort of laser focus, his dedication. And then he really brought that to, and, and he talks about actually that the, the whole risk side, that what he really got out of Ed Thorpe's book was this gambler's ruin idea, that as you're making these bets, even if in theory, you know, if you are counting cards, in theory, you've now turned the odds in your favor, you never make a bet more than 2% of all of your money because you can have a bad streak and then you've lost, kind of lost your principal. And, and so he calls that the, you know, the gambler's ruin. So at that point, he sort of learned all those things and then he applied them to his business. So as he was bringing in client money and he was thinking about how to deploy it, he had instincts about you know, going beyond just the vanilla bonds, but then he would be very careful to not deploy you know, too much in any one direction. Um, he really comes off as very focused, very thorough, very, very masterful. Um, okay, I'm just, I'm just gonna check the chat. Oh, we're good. Okay, great. And please, if you have any questions, definitely put them in the chat. Um, right now, we're sort of at a, you know, it's the Bond King, it's Newport Beach, California. He went to UCLA Business School. He comes out, he works for the Sleepy Insurance Company. Um, somebody whispers in his ear, this guy, Howard Rakoff, like, we got to be trading these bonds. What's weird is I don't know how Howard Rakoff, he doesn't figure into the rest of the story. I don't know how, if he ever made a lot of money, but um, so because the two partners are uh, Muzzy and Podlick. Uh, let me see. I think they're in the next. Uh, here they are. Okay. So, so here are like the founding people of PIMCO. So there's Podlick and there's Dian Dialinus and Muzzy and Melling. And, you know, so now all these guys were in the eighties um, and definitely making money in the eighties was like starting to be a thing. I mean, do you remember like Dallas, right? And J.R. Ewing and being, you know, like it was like kind of conspicuous consumption and things like that. So these guys were, you know, in the right place with interest rates, in the right place with like the consumer mindset, in the right place with their clients. Um, although I'm sure at first all of their clients were just institutions. I, I don't know when they started taking the regular investor money. Um, so 
that's where we are. You know, we're in California. Wind is at their back. They're doing smart things. They're really dedicated. They're relying like this management team gets along really well. They really respect Bill Gross. Um, and then you start to get into the sort of the founders issues, right? So later on in the investing discussion group um, in, in 2024, we're gonna do one that's just about startups. And, you know, cause entre you know, being, you know, if you have access to investing in startups, that's great. If you're planning a startup, I mean, starting a business is definitely a form of investing. Um, but the, I've read a lot of books about startups and what you start to see, it's like Bill Gross, very smart guy. Uh, very dedicated, very hardworking, in the right place at the right time, kind of catches something that, you know, like the, the timing was really good. People were ready for it. Clients were ready for it. Um, and then it's time to grow and expand and become a viable business, you know, and, you know, go from like the five managing directors. I, I mean, I think he talked about, you know, the whole shop was only like 40 people, and, and now today it's over 2000 people, right? So you can imagine those growing pains and like, you know, going into emerging markets and having marketing people and having all these issues. And Bill Gross is just not that guy. He loves investing and he loves sitting still and he, he's not a people person. And um, although he loved going on television, like he loved being a showman and he loved communicating with investors in a formal way, right? In a, in a newsletter way, in a TV show sort of way. But when it comes to actually like being collegial um, and, or even just being a manager, right? I mean, a lot of people will tell you management is terrible. Like having to focus on developing your employees and worrying about their concerns and, you know, shepherding them or, you know, chastising them if they've done something wrong. I mean, it's, you know, th these were, this was not his thing. And when he first started out, he had two partners who he could really lean on to do those things that he could just be left alone to trade. But he was kind of a victim of his own success. And so sort of in the way, like if you've ever read Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, I mean, the growing pains that Nike went through are just so interesting. And for Phil Knight, I mean, the, the funny thing was Phil Knight was a terrible boss. He wasn't mean, he wasn't abusive. He was completely absent. It is the funniest book. And again, this was like in the 60s and 70s where his employees are all over the country and he has one employee writing to him on like a daily basis, like not even a phone call because they, they were on a shoestring so they didn't even want the long distance charges, but he would send him letters and he would just tell him everything that was going on in his territory, everything that's going on with the business. And he'd be like, Phil, please, please just send me a letter back. Just give me some encouragement. And Phil Knight never did. And he talks about it in his book. He's like, yeah, he begged me. He begged me to write him back. I never did. Can you imagine like today with what we expect from our bosses to like take care of us? Um, so anyway, it's, it's just very interesting what founders go through. And Mark Randolph, who co-founded Netflix with Reed Hastings, Mark Randolph started out with you know, people he had already hired to do a different task. So he was working for a, a tech company. I don't even know which one. It was Reed Hastings tech, tech Company. And then Reed Hastings sold it. But Mark Randolph had already hired his entire staff. So he sort of had like a staff and nothing to do. And Reed Hastings was like, hey, you know, if you come up with a new business idea, maybe I'll fund it because I have some money. And Mark Randolph came up with the idea. Uh, so you have to imagine there were VHS cassettes and then there were CDs. And Mark Randolph came up with this idea just as the CD came out. Wow, that's like a thin, light thing that you could put in an envelope and mail it to someone. And everybody hates Blockbuster and nobody wants to wait on those lines and everybody hates to return, you know, forgets to return their VHS cassette. Let's just do CDs through the mail. And literally, this is something Mark Randolph thought of. And he and Reed Hastings were um, just, they were driving to work together. I mean, that they did the same commute. And, and Reed Hastings was like, okay, well, like, let's try it. And they are, and he already had his whole office already figured out for a small operation, right? So this sort of this founders, you know, what founders go through is that Mark Randolph did a fantastic job like the first two years at Netflix. And then when it was gonna become a real success, when it was time to hire like 
40 more people and really blow everything out and, and everything was just gonna get exponentially larger and the pressure was enormous. Mark Randolph really struggled. And, and Reed Hastings was like, I am taking away your CEO title. I mean, it was really, really crazy. And Mark Randolph was very upset, but you see how these things kind of play out. And so that's what's gonna happen. And that's what does happen. And that's what Mary Childs kind of beautifully explains in The Bond King that, PIMCO is a wild success and they're growing and growing and growing. And Bill Gross does not have the personality for it unless he has, you know, these sort of co-founders stay with him and just let Bill do the investing, let Bill do the strategy and let Bill be a little um, exacting and obnoxious to the employees and, you know, let, every, let, you know, let his co-founders handle the growth and the management and the things like that. Um, and that's that would have worked out great, except the co-founders, you know, moved on and left. And Bill was, you know, more and more tasked with like, you know, you're our leader. You've got to figure this out. And he he really struggled to be, you know, what the company wanted. And then they were looking for also he was aging and they're like, well, we need like a successor. And that's when the real drama starts to unfold. So then you get the palace intrigue. So it's Bill Gross. And in, I think it's 2008, they bring on Mohammed El Alarian. I, I think it's Mohammed El Alarian. I always say El Alarian, but it's Mohammed Alarian, even though it's E L Alarian, um, who is brilliant, um, highly educated, son of an Egyptian di diplomat, had been running the Harvard endowment. I mean, this guy is so qualified and so dignified and so diplomatic. And they're thinking, this is exactly what PIMCO needs, right? And Bill Gross wants him. Bill Gross recruits him. And, you know, it, it should have been great. It should have worked out, but it doesn't because Mohammed cannot share. Um, he just, he their styles are so different. And, Bill Gross keeps doing things that Mohammed think are just like uh, big no-nos, like like wildly not okay, and in, in how to treat people, in um, how decisions are made. Uh, it, I mean, if you just have totally different styles, like if if you're trying to share leadership with someone who thinks leadership is, you know, I'm going to really study the market and I'm going to decide our direction, and the other leader thinks leadership is, let's build a consensus let's get everybody around the table let's have everybody participate and then let's build a consensus from that those are totally different ways of handling leadership and so they just clashed and clashed and clashed um and then of course you know in the backdrop you have muhammad comes on and then there's this humongous financial crisis which um bill gross actually very graciously later on said he couldn't have handled it without Alarian because Alarian was just so well, so deeply knowledgeable about things that, you know, really got this, the uh, credit default swaps and the repo market and all these things that were just blowing up at the time of, of the financial crisis. Um, so it, it's a really, you know, if you care about kind of starting a business, growing a business, palace intrigue, um, how what what leadership means how it should work how to how to like you know watch your back all of these things it really it has this book has all of that it's just fascinating um and then you know but things things kind of come to a head and and the leadership team so by this point bill gross has sold the company so all the, the original founders have sold their company to allianz um and so how how could he even get ousted, right? Like you'd ask yourself, how could he get ousted if it's his company? But technically he could, because even though he was like the face of the company, he really didn't have the power to stay. But he was astonished that they didn't do, try to do more to kind of give him a slice, just let him like run the closed end funds or just do something, save face, you know, be in the office down the hall, you know, but just don't bother people, um, which, uh, he claims they didn't do. They claim he they tried. 
Um, but in any case, he was, uh, excuse my cat, he was fired. I mean, it was really uh, kind of a, a sad situation. Um, I, mean, I guess Alarian had walked off the set quit in a huff, was furious, and the only way they could get him back was to kind of promise to put Bill Gross's head on a platter, and they did. Um, and Bill Gross was out and went to Janice, and it shocked everyone and rippled through the market. Um, and also, sadly, Bill Gross got divorced. So um, it's, it's really, it, you just kind of wonder, reading something like this, or at least I wonder, I can't imagine being under that much pressure. I can't imagine I mean, I think they were definitely managing more than a trillion dollars at this point, a trillion. Um, I just can't even imagine that. Uh, but I was looking at, so this is Bill Gross's book that he wrote in 1997, all about bond investing. And, you know, people ate it up because he was doing so well and he was so knowledgeable. He had such a great track record. And in this book that he dedicated to his wife, he said, to my wife, Sue, who has been with me since my dawning and has given me the happiest 13 years of my life, if there be a heaven, I have caught a glimpse of it through you. You have my constant love and enduring respect. That's what he wrote in 1997. And then they had the financial crisis and he never came home. He talked about sleeping at the office, living at the office. It went on and on for years. Like, you know, he needed to, felt like he needed to protect his business. Um, we never get to hear Sue's side of the story, but she divorced him. So I don't know, you know, it's, it's a really interesting read. I, I would say like the, the one um, frustrating part of the book is I would love to hear Sue's side of the story. Uh, cause I think we all have to figure out how we manage, um, success and family and, but to how Bill Gross, you know, seemed so cold and, and calculating and disciplined and all these things. But when I read that dedication, I thought, oh man, he really loved his wife. And somehow it just didn't, it didn't get across. Like he just, he was gone too much. Or I would have, I would have loved to have heard her side of the story in any case palace intrigue, family drama, he gets ousted, he gets divorced. Um, and, you know, and it's all right there in the Bond King. So you can learn, <laughs> learn all about bond investing, learn about smart bond investing, learn all the things that could go wrong and what hurt the competition. Because PIMCO during the financial crisis does amazing things. They foresee the mortgage crisis. They foresee how risky these mortgage-backed securities are. And they just do amazing things to protect their clients. So they protect their clients on the downside. And then after the crisis, they see all of these opportunities. So they were just, they were just, you know, so head and shoulders above their competition for years. It was, you know, it's really fascinating to see. Um, but then, you know, it all comes crashing down. So, uh, one thing I would I would love if anybody else wants to weigh in, um, just because I having read a lot of these books now and um, knowing a lot of these very strong leaders. I I was reading Steve Schwarzman's book about you know when he founded Blackstone and um, I I really think that you have to be tough and you have you know as leaders have to be tough they have to be exacting they have to be demanding and when I was working for large companies that used to be okay, right? So I worked for, at one point I worked for US News and World Report and the president of the company, I sat right next to his office. His name was Fred Drasner. And uh, Fred Drasner still, I think he lives in Miami now and he's you know made a ton of money and he does other interesting th things. But he was, at one point he became co-owner of uh, US News and World Report. And, and then he was co-owner of the Daily News. But this guy was so tough. He used to scream his head off and he would curse you out if you made a mistake. And I mean, with the F word, you know, what the F were you thinking? And he's screaming in your face. And at night he would walk around literally with a baseball bat on his shoulder and he would knock on your door with his baseball bat. I mean, <laughs> I thought this guy was hilarious. I thought he was a character. And honestly, when I knew why he was yelling at someone, it was usually because they did something so stupid, they just lost $30,000. And I thought, I'm good with that. You know, <laughs> like we need this company to stay afloat. And today I just see like this 
a complete intolerance for that demanding, severe attitude. And um, Bill Gross was asked in interviews, you know, like, was he a jerk? Was he, you know, a bully? Was he hard to work for? And he's just baffled by this criticism. He's like, I'm in charge of so much money that belongs to other people. I'm the leader. I was exacting, right? And if you made a mistake, what were his words? I actually wrote it down. He would, he said he would berate someone if they made a mistake. Well, if you're making a mistake at PIMCO, you might be making a million dollar mistake. So I don't think being berated is necessarily that bad, but I just thought this, this was so interesting that um, Alarian ends up being so polished and so polite and so diplomatic. He's the son of a diplomat. But I'm like, I'm wondering, well, did then you set the standard too high for politeness? I mean, we, we still have to get results. You still have to get things done. Anyway, you can put your comments in the chat. I am starting to see sort of a, like the snowflakes are winning everywhere feel. And I don't know, I think it'd be very tough to run a business today to just, you know, to always keep your cool, always deal with people without any emotion. Um, I'd, I'd be curious what you think. Uh, let me see, anybody, anybody in the chat? Okay, so I'm just wondering, and I, I maybe I'm too sympathetic to Bill Gross. Um, I think you might be too, if you read, so, if you want Bill's version, right? So Mary Childs writes about him and write, and, and she's in, in charge of this whole narrative. And she does a great job. I just love Mary Childs. But Bill's version, if you want to hear it, is, um, so Barry Ritholtz does this podcast that is so good. I really, I mean, I could just listen to it all day. Masters in business. It really should be called Masters in Finance because what he focuses on, like the, you know, the top people at hedge funds and VCs and things like that. I mean, he's, he just gets the best speakers, the top people in academia who are like looking at finance and looking at behavioral finance, like Robert Schiller and Richard Thaler, he gets the best people. And he got to interview Bill Gross after everything happened at PIMCO. And I, you know, it's a, it's a two hour series. And I think it's so interesting, you know, that Bill's version was that, you know, he was pushed out. He was Chris criticized for things that, that really weren't true. Um, and it, you know, it was much more about egos and power and all the usual stuff. Um, and then he wrote his own book called I'm Still Standing. Uh, if, so if you're curious also about the, the Janice years and the third wife, <laughs> Apparently he's very happy with his third wife. Um, it's, it's a it's a great read. So do we have any questions? I, I've been doing all the talking. Oh my goodness, which I love. But um, does anybody have any questions about the Bond King, about Muhammad Alarian? I mean, I, I didn't get much of a chance to cover him, about Bonds in general. Um, I know we're also going to do, uh, Young's going to do, a, a part about databases. Young, are you are you there? I'm here. Okay, I, we don't have to do it yet. But are we? You're still going to do the part about databases, right? Uh, when do you want me to do it? Um, well, I was just going to do like just a few more things here, and then I'm just waiting for questions. Okay. Um, but so when you do your database thing, then we switch back to you, right? So so like. I don't know how to do that. I stop sharing my screen or whatever, but um, I'll, I'll, when, when, I have a few more slides, but when we get there, I'll- Okay, I'll, okay. I'll you... I'm here, I'm watching. Thank you. Okay, so if you want Bill's version, it's very easy to listen to Masters in Business. So it was the January 17th, 2015 podcast. And um, at least on the way I listen to podcasts, when I go on, I can hear- um, you know, I mean, I can just scroll through like it shows me everything back to 2015. So I don't think it would be that hard for you to find. Um, and then the library will very shortly have I'm Still Standing because they were nice enough to buy it for me. Uh, it only arrived today. So I was like quickly like scanning through and um, I can tell you the Janus years did not go well. Uh, he, you know, he just he, I, he he had something to prove. He started, he 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 lost his investing style. Like he was so good at managing risk, 
and the, and he kind of lost that because he had something to prove. He wanted to beat Pimco, and he just you know he even says himself, even though those were not good years, he should have just retired after Pimco. Um, uh, but now you know he's a, an amazing philanthropist. He's having a nice time with his much younger wife. He's having a good time with his family. So the library bought that book for me so that I could research it for tonight. And it's going to go back. It's going to go into circulation this week. So you could probably take it out next week. Okay. And then you know, let's just take this back to Pimco. Okay. So Pimco is an enormous company, right? It's very well run. Dan Ivickson has been there almost from the beginning, and he's the, the chief guy now. And you know, we were talking about the bond bloodbath. And you know, the truth is, if you're getting into bonds today, you know, that bloodbath does not affect you. So this is what I just worry about with people and hearing about investments. You know, when they hear that the stock market is crashing, they go, oh, I better stay away. It's like, no, that's when you get in, you buy on the dips. Or I hear the bond market's a bloodbath. Well, it was for those people because they were buying, you know, 30 year uh, bonds at a two year, 2% two rate, they're locked into garbage. But you today with rates being so much higher, you know, there's, there's really something to be said for looking at bonds and looking at what the opportunities are and studying it more and finding out, you know, what are the risks? What are the rewards? What should you get into? You know, and a lot of things you'll hear like the, the shorter duration, you know, the, the, there's tremendous yield on shorter duration and, you know, very low risk. You know, you can buy bonds directly from the, you know, um, oh gosh, what is the website when you buy bonds directly? It's, it's going to pop into my head, but literally just from your computer, you can buy bonds directly from the government and it's a risk. Treasury, it's a treasury direct. Thank you. Treasury direct. Um, I mean, I've done it. And um, yeah, so it, it's something it's like the yields are great. And why would you want to lock yourself into any kind of duration? Well, yeah. So like you go to the bank and you can get a good yield at the bank now, but they can change that at any time. So this is the whole game. Like what kind of duration do I want to lock myself into to guarantee this, this certain interest payment? Um, anyway, it's fascinating to me. Hold on. Let me just uh, see what's in the chat. What, what have we got? Uh, oh, wow. Kristen, on MSNBC and the news channels, there is more discussion of bonds today than say a year ago as interest rates have risen significantly. Short-term bond funds are yielding over 5%. Seems like a good time to allocate some money to bonds. Yes, that's, well, okay. I Because I have this disclaimer saying like, you know, I'm not giving you investment advice, but I, let's say Sally is giving you some investment <laughs> advice. I think Sally knows exactly what she's talking about. Sally Bednar actually is a veteran of the bond industry and a very, very, very smart lady. So I think you should listen to her advice and really be earmarking some dollars. Okay. Uh, so it was U.S. Treasury Direct was the website where you could buy bonds directly from the government. And then um, six months for 5.35%. So, um, Young, when you say six months for 5.35%, are you talking about U.S. Treasuries right now? Are you talking U about? Yeah, U.S. Treasury. U.S. Treasuries, right. Yeah. Um, and I would say, like, you know, even go I'll go longer on the duration, right? So when I talk about duration risk, I, you know, it's like it's those 10 years that, like, you stay away. Well, well I'm not giving investment advice, but, like, I, you, you could see why you might want to stay away from very long duration, because who knows? I mean, right, you know, interest rates could continue to rise to 8 9%. We hope not, but n nobody knows the future. Okay, Th these are that, you know, great thoughts. And thank you, Sally, for um, weighing in. Sally is so smart. And um, also I think everyone should vote for Sally for the RTM. I know that's coming up. So Sally Bednar, very smart lady, uh, resident of Greenwich and running for the RTM. Okay, anybody else want to weigh in with a bond question, a book question? Um, I'm also a huge, huge fan of Mary Childs, huge fan of Planet Money. So I really encourage you to check out um, any, you know, any podcast that she does is brilliant. Um, but again, so here's PIMCO and PIMCO, you know, they started out, they had institutional clients, but now they serve everybody. And, you know, bonds are back in my humble opinion. So uh, check it out. And remember, um, 
So, so we're going to do one thing with Young at the end of this because she, there are amazing resources for investors at the library that you can access from your home. So she's just going to do a quick demo on that. As you're sitting at home, you can access these proprietary databases for investors that are really expensive. But Greenwich being the most amazing library ever, having an, an amazing funds from the Peterson family, they pay for all of these things that it's just in, in, incredible. But I do want to remind you to join us in November and December. So November is a random walk down Wall Street. December is how to invest in real estate. Um, and then we go all through next year to June because we're sort of on this calendar more like the schools. Um, and if you want to know what all of those books are, you could just email me or email Young. Young, will you put your email in the chat? Okay. Um, if you, sure. If you want the whole roster for next year, uh, I know we're going to do The Price You Pay for College, which is a great, great book by Ron Lieber. Um, oh, like, uh, th that's probably Young putting her email in the chat. Yes, um, that's me. That's me. Okay, great. Um, but you could email me if you want to know the books that are coming up. And um, Young, I guess, do you want to take it away and, and uh, talk about the databases? Yes, but I can, I just tried, I you can only one person do the sh screen sharing. So after you're finished, I'll, I'll share my screen. I am finished. Oh, you're done? Okay, so I'll share my screen. Give me one second. Okay. Hello, can you see my screen? I can. Oh, okay. If you can, everybody else can. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is Greenwich Library uh, website, greenwichlibrary.org. From here, you can go to explore under research and resources. It's a little bit, you know, um, too many steps, but but that's the way it is. And explore, it's under explore, research and resources, and then database. And they can always email you if if they need help, because these are incredible databases and they're usually yeah. very expensive to access. It is, it is very expensive. I'm going to introduce to you briefly what we have for investment. So under database, you click here. Do not click business and resource. Database. Okay, business database here. So we have uh, some database you can only access from the library, like the first one, Bloomberg. We have Bloomberg terminal, but you can only access from the library. But this database, um, because it's a special terminal, you have to make appointment. You can use one hour per day, but if no one booked behind you, you can continue to use. You can book here online, or you can just give us a call and we can put your name down and reserve this time for you, okay? And then we all, if you want to find obsolete uh, stock information, you can click this database. In this database, you can only access from the library. You cannot access from home. And this one is foundation. A directory online for professional. This one is not for professional. It's actually it's a foundation database. This one is very easy to use. Uh, you can access database from the library only. During pandemic, this database you can access from home. But now um, the vendor only allowed our user to access from the library. And the grants individual by candidate is the similar to the foundation database. And this business, uh, Gale Business Insight Essential, this is a business news database. Um, not many people use it. And this guide star, uh, it's not a very popular either. This is a, this uh, guide star and the, and this one, the Gale, they are from the State Library of Connecticut. So we didn't pay for it. Uh, we have Historical Wall Street Journal. This one you can access from the library and you can also have remote access. This is um this covers Wall Street Journal from 1889 to 1998. So if you know the keywords of the title of a subject, 
of an author, you can search. You can get a full text article in PDF format. And we also have the current uh, Wall Street Journal, but that one is under the newspaper. Is under the newspaper under this link. Okay, so let me move on. Leadership Direct. This database um give you a brief um you can if you want to make a like a company directory you can use this. Uh, not much details for a company. I can give recommend a good one later. Okay, the next one is Morning Star. Morning Star, as you know, is the you know the most popular database. You search for mutual fund. So this database you can access from home and also from the library. This one is very easy to use. You can just put the the five letters of the mutual fund symbol, and you can get their rating. You can they will give you their performance rating. It's, this one is very easy to use. And it's plant research. This one is um for also for business trend, market research, corporate profile. You can access from the library and also from, from home. This one, Reference USA, is now changed name to Reference Solution. This one give you it's a business directory for both public and the private. This database you can access from home. Now I'll focus on two databases. The first one is called S&P Net Advantage. This is a very expensive database. This gives you comprehensive information for company, business, investment information. They also give you rating for the company's financial uh, situation and also have industry uh, survey. So this database you can only access from the library. So you have to come to the library to use the library computer. If you bring your own laptop to the library, it is still considered as a library from outside because the database only, uh, you can only access to this database from the library IP address. So let me show you how, what it looks like. Okay, I have to make the font bigger. So this database, you can see you have, um, you know, S&P is the biggest publisher for financial information. We used to have the S&P Outlook in print. It's a weekly uh, financial newsletter, but now they stopped, they stopped the printing. It's only published uh, online. Uh, I don't know if um, any of you use this CFRA report. This report, uh, you know, if you don't have access to our database, you have to pay for this. I receive uh, a lot of requests from individuals who do the market research. They ask me to email them the um, CFRA report from, you know, from this database. I'll show you the S&P Outlook newsletter, what it looked like. So from S&P, the, these are the S&P publication. You have the S&P Outlook, you have the ETF report, mutual fund report, and the newsletter. Okay, and you can have the ETF report. Okay, um, if, if, you, if you want to do a market research, for a, if you want to do a research for a specific company, this S&P Net Advantage only covers public company. So we can, let's give Apple, for example, Apple. You can type the stock symbol or the company name, either one. So you will see what it covers. So you will see their income statement, industry classification, summary, and you can see uh, equity research, key stats, investment research, company summaries. You can see their tier sheet, corporate timeline, business description, industry classification. You can also find people's information. 
their board member, the committee member, compensation, um, you know, people looking for job, they can find the, the key person in HR department, they're here. And also the financial uh, information, the company's income statement, balance sheet, cash flow ratio, and you can see peer review, analyze. And you can see the charting, their stock information. These are similar to what you can get from Bloomberg. If you want to invest in a company, you can, you know, you got to know the basics of the company. You know, I see people using Bloomberg, they find their company information. You can find the same information from S&P Net Advantage. Here is their fixed income. See their credit rating. You can see the credit rating. Uh, Kristen, can you hear me? Oh yeah, that's great. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Okay, good. And for investors, you know, invest relationship is also important here that information you can find. And also for public companies, all the reports, you know, SEC filing, annual reports, you can find those information here. Young, can you put in Starbucks and then go down to their credit rating? Because Okay, can you give me the uh, stock symbol? S-B-U-X. S-B-U-X. Yeah. Oh, it, it was there. Yeah. And then um, go down to credit rating. It's under fixed income credit rating. That's so interesting that it's, I thought they would have had a higher credit rating. So this is, <laughs> this is a really good tool. Like don't go investing in individual stocks without checking their current credit rating because the bond raters know. Uh -huh. And uh, this, okay. What is really good for this database is their um, industry report. Okay, because I, I make the font bigger so I cannot see the bottom. I make it smaller. See the industry surveys here. The industry survey. We're now looking at the Starbucks. So for this industry, you want to see how this whole industry go? They give you the overview. They give you the, um. okay, let me make the font bigger. This database is a little bit weird. Their interface is not very friendly. <laughs> See, here is the, the PDF sign here. These are the restaurants, industries, industry report, the current one. See, this is August 2023. And here, a hotel restaurant there is this industry report. Uh, open one and then give you see what they cover. Um, only two databases in our library that it covers uh, industry survey. This this one does S and P Net Advantage give you know very good industry survey, and also Value Line. I'm going to mention that later. So this is tell you the trend and also the business leads. They give you you know if you want to invest in certain industry, you want to see the whole picture of this industry. Okay. So this reports, you know, if it's not from S&P Net Advantage, you have to pay for it. If you go online, you have to pay for it. So this, so you can also find it here, industry survey from here. You can find it from the, each company or it's from the, from the top here. And also have give you the interest rate, you know, fixed income, yeah, lots of information here. Okay, so so much for S and P Net Advantage. Now let me go to Value Line. For individual investor, Value Line is the most in, most frequently used tool. This one you can access from home. You can access from the library and also access from home. For the library database, um, login is your library card number. And the password is your four digit pin. Okay, this is 
as this is a value line. You can, you know, the value line, the dashboard, you can browse the search for a market, the, the investment education. If you, the, if you use the print version, you usually start from here. See here, summer, and it make the font bigger. You can usually people start, if you're used to the print one, here is the summary and index. You know, value line, it, they, we have general investment survey. We have small cap investment survey. So I'll, it's a different one. So I'll show you later. So here is the industry survey. So this one also give you industry survey. It's very small. So if you want to see, you have to, you know, make it bigger. Okay, if you want, you know, in a uh, value line, uh, in general, people, what is the most popular function is they give you a, a snapshot, a PDF format for a company. So I like to use Apple as example. If you look, it will give you the report, like the, if you use, use to the print version, here is the PDF file. See, it gives you a ranking, financial strengths, and also here, um, commentary. You read more. Give it a reach. So this is the, you know, value line. They give you, you know, a snapshot for each company. These are their scores here. And they give you a business overview, business history, and also analyst report is here. It's just the anal industry analyst report is by this person. This article was on September 15th. Um, someone in the chat is saying, please look at PEP. Is that, I guess that's a stock. Is that Pepsi? I don't know. Is that Pepsi? Okay, let me see. PEP. Yeah, Pepsi. Okay, so what do you want to know about it? Uh, it was somebody in the chat. Okay, uh, I couldn't. I have too many window open. Oh, chat, let me open the chat. Oh. Okay, look at the rating. Okay, the rating. So Young, did you say this one, the value line one, you, you, can, you can access from home? I'm sorry, did you say you can access it from home or this is the one you have to come into the library? No, S&P Net Advantage, you have to use in the library. Value line, you can use it from home, but you have to have a Greenwich library card. The rank and you, and you have safe. to know your PIN, right? Like, so you yeah. have to know how- If you forgot your four digit PIN, you can call lending service. You know, they can, anytime they can reset your PIN. So the ranks, the safety is one, timeline is three, financial strength is A plus plus. So can you look at the value? Yeah, here is it. Any other question about? No, I haven't finished all the value line, but like you know, covers a lot of information. So this is only the one most popular function for value line. Uh, let me show you the other. Let me move this bar. Yeah, it bothers me here. Okay. Value line has many other functions. I'll show you. It's very good. It's a bit slow here, you know. So I just showed you a summary is the, is the general. There also, there is a small cap. This is general, the small cap. Small cap is...
it's a little bit slow. Maybe right now, many people are using it right now, so it's slow. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it um the database they only allow you maybe twenty people to use it at the same time. If more than that, they're just you know very very slow. But usually it's fine. Usually we don't have that many to use it at the same time. Maybe you know I'm doing a demo, so people. You know, it's just trying right, to right. access from home. So that's the problem. It's, okay, it's it's slow. It's not. Okay. Were, were you going to show another? Oh, no. Database? Oh, here. Okay. So I just tried to open that. It, it's just, this is um the VLIS current issue here. They will give you the small cap. And also another function is you can, if you want a list of company give you high dividends or growth, uh, growth stock, you can click here. They will give you, um, you know, high in high dividends. See, they also give you an investment survey. But this report is different from S&P Net Advantage. It's a different publisher, but you can compare if you want to invest in a, in a sector you're not familiar but you can compare. But on this screen, on the dividends, you can you can find, uh, see here, you can have a small cap, mid cap survey. You can, you can have the ETF report. So here, you can find the link. So from this, okay, the library will close. Okay, so here in on this screen, you can do some search. You can tell the computer to give you the small cap, average above what, and the best performing stock, you can make a list. If you don't know, if you want to do your stock um, research, you can do it from here. I want uh, the best performing stock. You can click here and then choose. Now they give you, and now they give the company. Uh, report and the industry report. Um, go back anyway to go back to the dashboard. So here, and there are also special uh, the app reported here. So you can play with more cap summary and in the index or the mid cap. You know, better line, if you're familiar with the print one, there are two binders. Mm -hmm. The binder is the general, is the big cap. Just for the better line, investment. There's another big cap. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, anything, anyway, dashboard is like the home page. The quick links are here. You can play with it. We did not buy those service. This one, you know, we have access to it. Young, was there another database or could you show them like if, do, can you show the screen like when they, if they have an online account, it's like when they go to log in, it, it's, their, it's their library card number and a pin, right? That's all they need to get. Yes, but here I cannot demo because I'm accessing from the library. So where it says account up in the corner, like if you click on that. This is, a not a, this is not a perfect example for value line. Usually we should have like this database, uh, s and oh, they only have one, the access database. It used to be two link. One is, see, like this, remote access, access from the library computer. So they make it very clear. But now they only give you one, some database they only give you one, but it doesn't matter. So if you're from home, you click on this database, they would ask you your login name. But here, since I'm accessing the library IP address, it won't ask me that. So I cannot oh, demo. I see what you're saying. Yeah. You know, I cannot right. demo because, okay, I know, I see maybe this one, maybe the Red USA. Uh, let me see this, oh, this one. 
remote access. No, because it's a library IP address. So if I click on the remote access, it still treats me as a library. Library, you know, it won't but, ask. So people me. need to be ready with their library card number and, and their the pin. pin. Yeah. yeah, if you forget your pin, always call the lending service. Uh, our hours are Monday through Friday, nine to nine. Saturday, nine to five. Sunday, one to five. You call lending service. Um, I think their phone number, let me write it down. Let me. You call this number, they will, they can always, they can, anytime they can reset your four digit pin. That's great. The library is really amazing. We, we're so uh, thank you, thank you. So, any other question about our um about our database? I think Morning Star is very easy to use. You just enter the you know the mutual fund symbol, the five five letters, and then yeah. boom, they will give you the you know performers, their history, their manager, all those information. Yeah, and if you if you don't have have a subscription, you know, when I go to use it at home, they're like, okay, well, why don't you join? <laughs> you know? Actually, I think that you you don't have to subscribe that. I think the free version is pretty much the same as our paid version. I I was using it to to research for this um this presentation, and I got to a certain point, and they were like, you need to subscribe, and I was like, oh, oh okay, I, I don't. Then do you that. go to our database. You go yeah. to our homepage. Okay, any more questions? I think it's about time. Yeah, we're past time, but that was great. Yeah. Thank you, Young. Okay, thank you. So you can- and Thanks thank everyone. You. Thank this you everyone. Great. Yeah, this is great. I hope to see you again next month. Thank yes. you. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye.